Good evening, and welcome on this Wednesday of the most blessed week of the year, Holy Week, as we come together as a community to praise and to celebrate, to worship our Lord. Tonight we will have a service which is a blending of the traditional evening prayer and a service of healing. It has been throughout church history a day when a service of holy unction or healing would be undertaken. And so tonight, at a point later on within the service, you will be invited to come forward to receive a special healing prayer and blessing um, from a number of clergy in the community who will be up here offering those prayers. Another note about the service here tonight and that is that our entire service is found within this red hymnal. But there's a catch. I'm not sure why. It seems to be a relatively uh, Lutheran tradition that we would have multiple sets of numbers within our hymnal. And so when you see ELW, this red hymnal, and a number, that is the big number found in the back portion, a hymn number. Anything that is in the 300s or 200s here uh, are the little numbers at the bottom of the page. Again, I'm not really sure why we continue to do this, but it's the third or fourth hymnal that is set up this way. And, and yes, it's confusing. Uh, I apologize for that, uh, but it is uh, a wonderful opportunity to gather together and celebrate this service of healing. And so we need to use the hymnal. After the service, we do have refreshments, so I encourage all of you to stay and share in this fellowship. A reminder that many of our community congregations have services tomorrow night for Monday, Thursday, as well as Friday night for Good Friday. I don't know all uh, of those and all of the times, but I do know that if you want to worship, you will find uh, an opportunity to celebrate this Holy Week in one of the congregations of our community. Our service begins tonight on page 309 with our opening for evening vespers. If the congregation would please rise. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. We sing together our hymn of light, hymn number 592.
The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you called light into being. And you set lights in the sky to govern night and day. In a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, you led your people into freedom. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May your word be a lamp to your feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And with all your creatures we give you glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. before you as in to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. The congregation may be seated. Our first lesson for this evening comes from the book of Exodus, and it comes from the 11th chapter. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go hence. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. 
speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewelry of silver and gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant, who is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever shall be again, but against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, not a dog shall growl, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get you out and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this evening is Psalm number 105, verses 23 to 29. Israel came into Egypt, and Jacob became a sojourner in the land of Ham. The Lord made the people of Israel very fruitful, more numerous than their enemies. in the land of Ham. You sent darkness and it grew dark, but the Egyptians rebelled against your words. You turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to Our second reading for this evening comes from the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter. After this, I heard what seemed to be the mighty voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice crying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals crying. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. 
for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and though his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you rise as you are able in body and spirit for the reading of the gospel this evening? From the gospel of John chapter 13, verses 21 to 32. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do click quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse... Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
You may be seated. Pastor Jeremiah said he usually preaches from the aisle, which I wasn't going to do, but that light's a little aggressive over there. So I think that I'm going to preach from the aisle. <laughs> All right. Well, when I read this scripture and paint the image in my head of what's happening, I find myself chuckling a little bit. Sure, it starts on a serious note. Jesus feels troubled in spirit and declares that one of the disciples gathered around the table will betray him. But then I imagine the disciples looking at each other with this sort of dopey look on all of their faces, trying to figure out which one of them will betray him. I think when we think of the Last Supper, we sort of picture the Da Vinci's Last Supper with everyone very pristinely all sitting on the same side of the table, which isn't really practical, is it? Um, But at Passover, they were likely at a low, U-shaped table sitting together, and they were likely on cushions, partially reclined, relaxing, leaning on their arms, leaning back. The scripture even says leaning on each other. So even though Jesus is feeling tense at this moment, the disciples are celebrating Passover. They might have even let their guard down a little bit here. And the scripture tells us the disciple who Jesus loved is reclining next to Jesus. And in the midst of the ruckus of everyone trying to identify the betrayer, Peter leans over to get the beloved disciple to ask Jesus, who is it? Who's the betrayer? Can't you hear it? Peter, like a schoolboy saying, you're his favorite. You ask Jesus who will betray him. I'm not going to do it. You're his favorite. So the beloved disciple does. And Jesus answered, the one whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped in the dish. We know it's going to be Judas. The gospel lets us, the reader, know early on to be prepared for his betrayal. But the disciples, they don't know. So Jesus dips the bread, hands it to Judas, and as Jesus hands him the bread, our scripture says, Satan entered Judas. Judas, Jesus tells Judas to do what he's going to do quickly, and then nothing more really happens. It's strange. It doesn't say the beloved disciple whispered his question to Jesus or that Jesus was sneaky about handing this piece of bread to Judas. Why haven't the disciples jumped up in shock and anger at Judas being identified as the betrayer? There's no drama. We know some of the disciples have a temper. James and John are referred to as the sons of thunder in the Gospel of Mark, and We know that Peter, he's going to cut a guy's ear off to try and keep Jesus from being arrested. I find it hard to believe no one wanted to throw a punch at Judas when they find out he's about to betray Jesus. But Judas just walks out unscathed. And then the disciples are confused. Tonight's gospel reading tells us the disciples didn't understand why Jesus told Judas to do quickly what you are going to do. They thought Jesus wanted Judas to buy some items needed for the Passover celebration or to give some food to the poor. And I wonder how did they miss it? How did they not hear and see the interaction that happened between Jesus and the beloved disciple? How did they not see the interaction between Jesus and Judas? Whenever we talk about the disciples, acting kind of dumb at Bible study at Long Swamp UCC, I talk about how comforting I find it. I find comfort that the disciples asking questions and continuing to get it wrong and making mistakes, even though they have Jesus right there in front of them leading the way. Because that means we are bound to make our own mistakes too, and that's okay. As we journey to be better followers of Jesus, we're going to mess up just like those disciples did. Because like the disciples, we don't know it all, and we don't understand it all. 
Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, even writes, Now I know only in part, then I will know fully. And in many of our communion liturgies, we say each time we ready ourselves to take communion, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Part of our faith is embracing that mystery. So what don't we know? What don't we understand about this evening's gospel? I'm not sure we fully understand who Judas is. We see him as the bad guy, the betrayer, because we're told that from the very beginning. But there's no indication the disciples felt that way. Judas's behavior up until this point didn't make the disciples suspect that he was the one to betray Jesus. They point fingers at each other, not him. And we don't fully know Judas's motivation either. For many years, it was assumed money was probably one of Judas's motive, but that's not consistent throughout the Gospels. Sometimes in movies and you know musicals and things like that, Judas is portrayed as portrayed as being angry at Jesus, perhaps for not being the mighty military leader he hoped for, or not fully agreeing with Jesus's message. But there's no clear-cut answer. Yes, tonight, it's Judas who hands Jesus over. But he's not the only one making mistakes. By Friday, it'll be Peter who denies him and many other disciples who flee and don't follow him to the foot of the cross. All of them make mistakes. Plus, if we return to what's written in John, it says at the moment Jesus handed the bread to Judas, Satan entered him. So Satan had a role in Judas's betrayal too. There's just so much of the mystery that we have to embrace, especially during Holy Week. Faith that promises to prove firm answers and to relieve any and all questions we have is a faith that doesn't live up to the realities of the world, right? How often do the challenges and tragedies in our lives make sense? We get sick, we lose people we love, those close to us hurt and suffer. Even sometimes the good things happening in our life don't make a whole lot of sense. Faith and life are full of mystery, but that can be unnerving and stressful to sit in that mystery all the time. So what do we know for sure then? The Gospel of John has not often been concerned about super specific details and facts, but rather what's the bigger picture, the bigger truth. Crucifixion is on the horizon, which means the ultimate outcome of salvation is near. This story isn't about Judas or any one disciple's mistake. The story of Jesus' crucifixion is a cosmic story of God versus evil, of good versus evil, and how redemption comes to us through this mysterious story. But there is something the Gospel of John is very clear about, and that's love. The story of Jesus identifying Judas as his betrayer is sandwiched between stories of Christ's love. Before the section of scripture I read this evening is when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, an ultimate act of servanthood, something Jesus did so we, as his followers, could emulate Jesus' loving humility, not just with foot washing, but in how we live and care for one another. The scripture after this evening's gospel story is Jesus sharing with the disciples a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And this love that Jesus preaches and teaches and lives out each day is limitless because even knowing Judas's betrayal is afoot, Jesus still invites Judas to sit at the Passover table. Jesus still shares the Last Supper with him. And Jesus even identifies Judas as the betrayer 
with an act of friendship and grace, the act of offering and sharing bread together. Being a Christ follower, a Christian, is not about having all the answers. It isn't about knowing everything, having it all together. It isn't about not making mistakes. It isn't even about having the perfectly correct beliefs. Because we see in the disciples this evening confusion. We see them missing what's right in front of their faces. We see them making some pretty big mistakes at pivotal moments in Jesus' journey. Following Christ is, however, about love. Love that is sometimes modest and unassuming. Love that is sometimes vibrant and wild. Love that inspires us to serve others in meaningful ways. Love without qualifications. Love for God, for self, for others, for all creation. A love that gives us the freedom and space to not have all the answers, to not always get things right. Love that makes us feel safe and comfortable embracing the mysteries of faith and the mysteries of our lives. Because we know that Christ's act of love on the cross is enough. So may all of our faith journeys this Holy Week lead us not to perfect answers, not to certainty, not to orthodoxy, not to knowing at all, but to a love shown to us in the life and death of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.
The congregation may be seated. Our Lord Jesus healed many as a sign of the reign of God come near us and sent the disciples to continue this work of healing with prayer, with the laying on of hands and anointing. In the name of Christ, the great healer and reconciler of the world, we now entrust to God all who are in need of his healing touch. Let us pray. Glorious Lord, you have created this day for us, and we rejoice and are glad within it. Each new morning sees us rise to the splendors of your created kingdom. And dear Lord, we thank you that all that you had made and created as good sustains us and provides for us a home. But Lord, we have made mistakes, and we will continue to make mistakes. We don't always care for this creation the way we ought. Heavenly Father, grant us the knowledge and the wisdom, not only to love and care for the created world, but truly to appreciate it. In your great mercy, hear us, O God. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with this church. And we're not talking about the congregation gathered here, but your church in this whole world along with our many sisters and brothers this night, we lift up our prayers to you. We think, dear Lord, of the passion of your Son. We hear your word spoken to us. And yes, Lord, if left to our own devices, we will find nothing but error. However, you do speak to us through your word, one truth, your Son, the way, the truth, and the life. Help us through all of our broken thinking and broken desires, all of our improper actions and, well, not so well thought out words, to really and truthfully understand your will for us in this world. Lead us by your love and help us to be people that honor the greatest commandments, to love and to serve you with all that we are and to love and serve our neighbors as ourselves and not just the neighbors that we think we like, but all people. Even, yes, Lord Jesus, even unto those we deem to be our enemies. You call us to understand the truth and the power of love and to march towards it in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And so, Lord, we pray for your wisdom once more. In your great mercy, Amen. Heavenly Father, Apart from you, there can be no pure healing. You have given us many different skills and abilities. You have granted us great wisdom already. We have discovered amazing things in caring for not only the human body, but all life. Sometimes we use them well, and sometimes we abuse them. But no matter what we do, Lord, we can't create perfect healing. It's only through your grace and by the power of your love that we find true healing in body, in mind, and in spirit. And so tonight, we pray for all our brothers and sisters who are in need of that healing touch, keeping in mind that each of us needs some sort of healing. And so along with our very own hearts, minds, bodies, and souls, we lift up all those for whom we pray tonight, naming them either silently in our hearts or out loud upon our lips. We pray for all those 
who serve in our nation's armed forces and for all those waiting for them back at home. We pray for those who work in any way, Lord, that help us, protect us as first responders or help produce our food as there are many right now out in the fields beginning to plant for next fall's harvest. We thank you for those who teach and those who serve in so many different capacities. We couldn't name them all now, but we pray for their safety, their continued strength, and in their hearts to know that they are loved and appreciated by you and by others. Gracious God, for all those whom we have lifted up, we ask for healing. In your great mercy, hear us, O Lord. Sisters and brothers, we have lifted up our prayers. Now I invite you to come and receive a sign of healing and wholeness in the name of the triune God. As you come forward, we're not really going to dismiss. We're going to ask you to form a a nice line up here and come to the the closest clergy member, um, and we will offer a prayer uh, of healing and anointing. Are you able to help? Do you want to help? Heavenly Father, this your servant, E.G. Let me turn off my mic.
Let us pray. Living God, through the laying on of hands and anointing, grant comfort in suffering to all who are in need of your healing touch. When they are afraid, give them courage. When afflicted, give them patience. When dejected, give them hope. And when alone, assure them of the support of your holy people. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
our offering for this evening uh, is found in the narthex. There is a basket back there. All loose offering will go to the Brandywine Food Pantry. And if any of you leave your offering for your home congregation uh, in its envelope, we will see to it that that gets back to your home congregation. Let us meditate now on the ways in which we can give unto God and his people in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, as well as our time, talents, and treasure. Our service concludes on page 316. You may remain uh, seated, you may stand, or you may kneel, whichever uh, feels appropriate to you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole, for the peace of the whole world, for the For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For the health of the creation, for abundant harvest that all may share, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For public servants, the government, and those who protect us, for those who work to bring peace, justice, healing, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel, for those who are sick and suffering, and for those who are in captivity, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance in the time of affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For all servants of the church, for this great assembly, and for all people who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. giving thanks for all who have gone before us and are at rest, rejoicing in the communion of all the saints. We commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils yet unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and our love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray together the words that our Lord and our Savior Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. As we depart, a big thank you um, to uh, the Reverend Kim Baronado uh, for her message tonight. Um, we also thank all of those who have come together in our community choir and for Nancy uh, leading them. And thank you all for coming out and joining us. Please take a few moments to come and grab something to eat. And as we go forth, we go forth in love, to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve one another. Thanks be to God.